Halt! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So thank you very much, and, and please be seated. So my name is Tony Penny, and I'm the director of the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Uh, and I am so honored to be joined on stage by four recipients with us today, representing uh, 70 years of military and American history, starting with, uh, to my immediate right here, technician fifth grade Robert Maxwell, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions during World War II. We have Colonel Jackson here, who served 33 years, uh, served in World War II Korea and Vietnam, was awarded the Medal for Action in Vietnam. So thank you for joining us today. We also have Colonel Vargas, U.S. Marine Corps, awarded the Medal for Action in the Vietnam War. Thank you for joining us today. And last but not least, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie, uh, U.S. Army Ranger, awarded the Medal for Service during the War on Terror. So thank you very much. Now before we get started, I wanted to take just a, just a moment to recognize some of the folks who are joining us in the audience today. Uh, first of all, we have some, uh, some of our colleagues from the National Archives. I see our curator, Mr. Andy Swan, is here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have uh, many of our friends from the Simi Valley Unified School District. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we also have uh, from the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, our Chief Administrative Officer, Joanne Drake. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we have, uh, as a result of a partnership we've had for five years now that has brought this program to the Reagan Foundation for each of the last five years, the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation Education Team, as led by Vice President of Education Kathy Metcalf, and many of their team members are here today as well. Uh, and finally, I want to recognize the family members of our recipients who are joining us here today, Verda Maxwell, Landon Petrie, Dottie and Matt Vargas, and Rose Jackson. So thank you all so much for joining us today. So today, the, the Medal of Honor Foundation has put together a remarkable character education program. Uh, so what I wanted to do with our panel today is I wanted to talk a little bit about character, obviously, because of the, the program. Uh, but I also wanted to tie character in with the concept of American history. We're, we're fortunate to have uh, conflicts from World War II up through the War on Terror represented today. Uh, and for those of you who are students of history, you'll know that our country has changed quite a bit over those years. Uh, and so I want to hear from our recipients a little bit about what the, what the country looked like and, and how character has evolved over time. And I want to start by, by reading a, a bit of a quote from President Reagan uh, that leads into this. So President Reagan in 1993 gave a commencement address at the Citadel, and he talked about character. And this is what he said. You see, character that takes command in moments of crucial choices has already been determined. It has been determined by a thousand other choices made earlier in seemingly unimportant uh, moments. It has been determined by all the little choices of years past. When life does get tough and the crisis is undeniably at hand, when we must in an instant look inward for strength of character to see us through, we will find nothing inside ourselves that we have not already put there. 
So my first question, I want to start with, with Mr. Maxwell here, is I want to talk about those thousand pieces and decisions that, that led up to you and, and the character that you have. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your life. You were, you were born in Boise, Idaho. Yes, and could you tell us a little bit about what life looked like when you were born? Describe the America of your youth. I, I don't know what it looked like at that time. <laughs> but I have heard my mom and dad talk about it. Uh, one of the things that affected my life very greatly was when my mom and dad separated and uh, went, each went their separate ways. My grandparents took, took me in on a farm in, in Kansas, so I grew up in the Dust Bowl where I knew what it meant to work. I knew what it meant to uh, get hungry once in a while and uh, things like that. Things like that. And so you're, were your grandparents then big influences on your life when you think back to the early of your understanding of character? Very much so. My grandma was a disciplinarian of the family, and uh, it seemed like she could find a willow switch in Kansas where there wasn't any. <laughs> and I felt it quite often. And grandpa was, uh, he was a quiet individual, very, very, uh, uh, Oh, he, he understood what, what, he, uh, what his uh, goal was in life. He understood what it meant to raise a family. And uh, I, I really learned from his influence much, much less than his words, although we did have a few conversations. Yeah. Um, and when you joined the service. So when I was doing research, I, I read a little bit that uh, your, your grandfather was a Quaker yes, sir. Uh, and a pacifist. Yes, sir. Um, and much of the country, if you look at the buildup to, to World War II, was very, you know, we need to stay out of this. This is a European uh, issue. The United States shouldn't get involved in this. Um, so the, but you, your mind changed. You, uh, what, what was the event that happened that made you want to join the military? Well, I think it was, uh, the draft changed my mind. The draft. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at, looked at the, uh, the boys that were going to, to service, my neighbors, friends of mine, people were entering a service and going who knows where to do who knows what. And I said, well, uh, Lord, Forgive me, but I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll do what you want me to do. And I've repeated that to the draft board, and so <laughs> they, they, uh, they, sent, they sent me to the infantry. Excellent. And that was uh, the ground pounder from then on out. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, so, Colonel Jackson, I'd like to, to turn to you now. Uh, so one of the things that I found really interesting when doing the research for this was that the day you were awarded the medal by President Johnson, uh, there was another soldier who was also awarded the medal, uh, a young man by the name of Stephen Pless, uh, and that both of you were from the town of Noonan, Georgia. Yeah. So I looked at the population records of Noonan, Georgia, just to determine how big Noonan, Georgia was at those times. Uh, and do you have any idea what the, what the population was? It was approximately 5,000 people. Everybody knew everybody else practically, and so... Uh, but I never knew Steve Pless because he was quite a bit younger than I, and I had left town a, a lot earlier. And so I, I never knew Steve Pless until the, the ceremony at the White House. In, in, in that day, so one of the things that President Johnson said, he might have said it to you, or I've, I've read this, that he said, there must be something down in the water there in Noonan, Georgia. Yeah, uh, he, he, that, was his, uh, that was his rationale for the two of us being awarded the medal from the same hometown that there was something, you know, maybe like uh, wine or whiskey or something like that, <laughs> that, that might have stimulated us to, for the actions, but that's not the case. It was, it was strictly the water. Strictly. <laughs> and so what was it? So when you think back to, to growing up in a, in a small town, when you think about, you know, the values of this program, things like integrity and courage, uh, did, how did that show itself when you were growing up, or who were the role models that you had? 
well, I really didn't have any, any role models. I had a few uh, aviation role models like Jimmy Doolittle and uh, oh, the, uh, the guy in uh, the ace in World War II uh, was him. Uh, but uh, I think the thing that, that kind of helped shape my character was that uh, when I was about uh, uh, 12 years old, I became a Christian. And one of the things that uh, was taught to me by my mother and, and the minister was uh, always, always do the right thing. Now, I've tried to do that and I've not always been successful, but uh, that's one of the things that you have, have to uh, evaluate and try to do the right thing. And my philosophy is the one thing that you would absolutely positively not like to do is probably the right thing to do. Can you, can you think of a time from your past where that, that maxim was put to the test? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I went to, to the Korean War, it was... Uh, I had several occasions that I would not like to have done something, and I did. And again, in the, in the Vietnam War and uh, the rescue of those three guys, I, I really didn't want to go down and, and pick those guys up, but it, it was the right thing to do. So uh, that has guided my character for many, many years. Excellent. So I wonder if you could talk about, so having served in, in three major conflicts, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, how did the country change? How, did, how, were, how was being a soldier different across those, those time periods? Well, when I first got in, the soldiers, uh, the army was made up of a lot of riffraff that uh, were, got into trouble with the law and the judge would, would uh, sentence a guy uh, to either go to jail or uh, join the army. So they had a lot of guys that were of questionable character. Uh, but when the draft started in 1941, we, we get, began to bring in civilians that had a different attitude and a, a different feeling. They were not in because they had committed some minor crime of some sort, but uh, they were selected by the country to come in and to help protect the United States. Because in those days, the uh, military was, was very weak. And I remember uh, in 1941, going on the maneuvers in South Carolina, and we, didn't, we did not have military equipment. It just was not available. Uh, they had jeeps with the sign on it that says, tank. And a lot, of the, a lot of the soldiers really were using broomsticks as a replica of a rifle in the maneuvers. So a lot of those things, uh, we, were, we were trying to get prepared for war, but we had a late start. Sure, well, maybe I'll throw this question to, to both of you. So when you think about that, the World War II, and you mentioned training with brooms and jeeps that said tank on the side, yeah. and you think on the other side of the of the ocean, you have the German military machine, which is millions of soldiers, some of the most advanced war technology on earth. What was it like training, knowing that you were getting, preparing to go fight uh, the Germans? Well, if we, were, we were not uh, thinking too much about uh, getting prepared to fight the Germans because uh, Roosevelt had a policy of uh, uh, being a pacifist and he had made several promises that uh, we are not going to war. And like a, a good guy, I believed him, you know, but uh, when December came along in 1941, uh, we were thrust into war, not of our own choosing, but at the choosing of the Japanese forces and later, a uh, short time later, by Hitler himself. Excellent. So. Uh, Colonel Vargas, mm. uh, you served in Vietnam, but you, you had older brothers uh, who served both in World War II and Korea. So in some sense, within your family, you saw this progression of, 
how soldiers evolved. So what was that like uh, growing up uh, and having older brothers who had, who had been in the service, and, and what was it that influenced your, your choices? Well, first of all, I just want to say that I'm most honored to be sitting with Bob and Joe and, and Leroy. At, uh, these are sort of my heroes. I've read their backgrounds, and, and I really admire what they went through. In regards to my upbringing, as you know, my parents were immigrants, and, and uh, mom was from Italy. Um, Dad's Hispanic. Uh, I had uh, three brothers. Uh, Angelo was in, uh, started out in the Navy, but he got smart and went into the Marine Corps. And, uh, and uh, Joseph uh, was the right above me, but he was Air Force, but he also went in the Marine Corps and then uh, ended up in the Corps. And then Frank was uh, a Marine. So we all, uh, uh, and, and you know, I had a, not pressure, but as you probably have read, I, I went into, out of college into some pro baseball and, and I didn't make it all the way, came back home and, and I thought that, uh, you know, that my life was devastated, but uh, I had a great dad and, and mom that uh, really said, you know, how many kids make it that far in, in pro, pro athlete, athlete, athletics? And, and I said, well, and then how I got into the Marine Corps was, my gosh, you know, the family was all Marine at the time. But my Italian mothers did not want me to go into the Corps. And uh, she says, you know, you, you ought to go into the Navy or the Air Force because they sleep on white sheets and big pillows, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, don't go into the Marine Corps and, and, or the Army. And it's, you know, they're, they're out there digging holes and so forth. And, so she assigned my three brothers on one Sunday afternoon to, their mission was to convince me not to go into the Marine Corps. But that meeting was very, very short because Angelo, uh, who was a veteran of Iwo Jima, and Frank, who was a veteran of the Battle of Okinawa, and Joseph was the, the Choson Reservoir survivor. Uh, the meeting was very short. Angelo leaned over and said, uh, if you don't go in the Marine Corps, we're going to break your legs. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, a quick lesson. Uh, my folks and my upbringing was in a very small town like, like Joe's. Uh, in fact, he was, uh, we were about six or 7,000 people. Everyone, again, knew each other. Very tight community, very loyal, very patriotic. Uh, many of the sons of the community went into World War II, especially right off the bat. I remember, I was just a puppy at the time, but I can still vividly remember the, uh, the, set, the good times and the sad times. The good times was, uh, you know, uh, how patriotic the community was at that time, my little hometown. There were flags all over, there were pennants in the windows, there were flowers all over the place. And it was just, it was America. And I wish, I wish we had that same patriotism uh, throughout our entire United States today. Uh, it's coming back. It, it's, it's on its way back. But uh, the happy times was, was really uh, how, how close-knitted the family was and the families of that entire community with all the sons and daughters that were off into the, into the war. Korea uh, was the same, same way. Uh, but World War II dominated our community. We had a, a mixture of immigrants from all over the world at the time. Uh, the sad part was uh, Tommy Yoshida, uh, my little play buddy. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know what happened to Tommy one night. All of a sudden, all the Japanese uh, uh, immigrants, well, they were citizens then. They were rounded up and they disappeared overnight. And uh, I was really upset that Tommy took off. I missed him and loved him dearly, but I was really upset because he had a uh, two of my Hopalong Cassidy pistols and holsters that, that he took with him wherever they went. And I found out later on in life where they did go, and it was a sad thing. But uh, uh, my brothers survived. All of us uh, survived uh, combat. Uh, uh, we were, I, I'm not bragging about them, but they were, they were heavily decorated. And they never st spoke of the war or combat until the night that I received the medal from President Nixon at the White House. We went out to dinner, uh, and Dottie and the, and the, and the other ladies, uh, sister-in-laws, I guess, they went off to chat, and the guys went over and chatted, and I, that's when I learned that what my brothers really did in combat. They never spoke of it. Uh, you know, you, if you, those of you who have read about Iwo Jima, that was horrible. 
The Battle of Okinawa was horrible. The Chosun Reservoir was horrible. Well, Vietnam wasn't a piece of cake either, but none of them, neither was Royce, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq battles. But uh, what I enjoyed uh, most of all was how patriotism really was, was flourishing beautifully throughout our nation. And, uh, and it kind of petered out in, in the Vietnam era. A lot of people became anti against the war. And, and, uh, but I will want to, I do want the students to know that that at each one of our wars, we were victorious, even in Vietnam. Uh, my Marines never lost a battle. We never lost one firefight. And uh, uh, neither did our every soldier, airman, or Coast Guard, or any, any service personnel that served over there. That, we won that war. Uh, it was back home as the politicians uh, kind of went against it, and all of a sudden, the, the war kind of ended in a sad way. That was Vietnam. Uh, I guess the happy times is uh, when I'm honored to sit among <clears throat> these three gentlemen and the other 77, well, that, you know, there's only 77 of us, 77 of us alive today. Uh, we'll, we'll soon, rumors are flying that we will pick up another recipient here shortly. Uh, but other than that, uh, uh, to the students, uh, I'll close out later on with a few guidance that uh, were given to me by my brothers and my parents and so forth, but uh, uh, I'm so happy to be among all of you, and, uh, and I really uh, cherish uh, uh, the future of America as it sits right in front of me, and hopefully we'll have maybe a president selected right out of this group right here. I hope so, because I think you're a better candidate than some of those that I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and so, um, Master Sergeant Petrie, so uh, you, you grew up in a different era, uh, different conflict. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up. You also grew up uh, in the southwest. We, have, we go from Winslow, Arizona to, to Santa Fe. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about your youth and, and ideas about where character came from for you. I was the youngest of three brothers for about 13 years and it seemed like my parents we're always going to the hospital, get one of us stitches or staples, or because <laughs> we we love to uh, we love to get in fights with each other and argue like siblings do. And we were a little more rough because mom and dad were both off at work and no one there to stop us and say, "Hey, that's that's enough." And so we uh, we really had it after each other. And I think um, 13 years later, my my, my parents had two other children, my younger brothers, and so I ended up being the middle brother. Well, as the older brothers were already moving out of the house and moving on with life, I became the one that needed to take care of my younger brothers, both because uh, I was starting to drive at that time, getting them to school, getting them ready for school before I got to school, and it put a lot of responsibility on me, and I thought it was great, though. Um, my mom always said if 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 any of you guys move out of the house, Leroy is going to be the only one that survives. Because he's the only one that ever helped me in the kitchen and <laughs> learned how to cook. And we joked that my older brother burns water, but it was uh, <laughs> seeing my parents and how hard they worked um, to provide us the best life they could and, and uh, having responsibility at a young age really, really set the tone for me. Uh, I grew up in a in a city where there wasn't a lot of kids that were graduating high school. There was a lot of drug influence during, during my era. Um, there was a lot of gangs, a lot of influences out there. And uh, it wasn't always easy to, uh, to say no to some things. Sometimes I, I slipped into that crowd where I would go off with the, the ditching crowd and what I thought was popular. And, it really uh, stood out when, when I saw Desert Storm on, on uh, television because my mom's cousin was serving overseas and, and it, it really made me think, well, what is he over there risking his life for? Let somebody else go do that. And then I dug deeper and I realized that he was over there for our family and that sacrifice and selfless service was what stood out in my mind. And, I said, I want to have the opportunity to do that. And again, 
just like Jay said, when I was walking up here on the stage, I was glad I was in the back because all these men served before me and I'm honored to share the stage with them. But uh, it gave me the opportunity to grow up in a free country, one where uh, it was provided for me while I was growing up at no cost to me, but I wanted to give back. And that's part of the reason I joined the service. But uh, the peak on 9-11 when the Twin Towers were hit in New York City, the only thing I can, uh, I've only read about it in books or heard, hear stories about the patriotism. But I was in ranger school and when I got to go out on a weekend pass, there wasn't anywhere you could go in the country where the people across America were up in arms in patriotism, supporting our troops. And it's, it start, it's kind of not at the uh, peak that it was, and we don't expect it to stay at the top, but uh, keeping that patriotism alive across our country is important. Our men and women are overseas still today. Uh, a lot you don't hear about unless something goes wrong, but uh, they're the reason we're here today, and I, I, I know that, we all know that from being in their same exact situations. Excellent. So I want to kind of pick up. So a, a couple things that have been mentioned so far that, that are two very transitional times in, a, in American history where the world changed in an instant. So one that we've mentioned is, is Pearl Harbor, uh, where the U.S. was suddenly thrust into World War II and we had this galvanized spirit. You talked about the, and the patriotism that happened after 9-11, where the country really came together uh, and realized that we were fighting a greater evil, that this was a, a threat to our existence as a country. Uh, and, and during times like that, the country comes together. They, they make a commitment to one another. Um, and I was wondering if you'd be willing to share some stories. So after, after Pearl Harbor, what you saw in the service or what you saw in your communities of the way that America came together, that they decided to, to sacrifice for the greater cause. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Maxwell, sorry. <laughs> I remember uh, prior to World War II, for a few years after that, the typical family, in, in the evening around the supper table, you found all the kids and the mother and father together, and they were talking, they were having good conversation. And they're talking about the affairs of the world, and they're talking about other things, the things that happened in the family. These were the things that held America together at that time. The families were, were a unit and no longer scattered to the winds, uh, mom and dad both working and all that sort of thing. Uh, I think that was the, the one thing that held America together was the un unity of the family and the common uh, desire of the people to do what was right in the world, and that was to, to take this war on and get it won. Um, so, similar question to you. So after, after Pearl Harbor, um, what did you see in the country, in, in, the, in the unit that you served with? Well, I'd, I'd like to go back and, uh, uh, a little earlier than that. Sure. When I was a little kid, five years old, uh, I, I knew what I wanted to do in the future. I wanted to, number one, be an airplane mechanic, and I wanted to fly an airplane. And that was, every, that was when I was five years old. I got that ambition, and my life, up until even to now, uh, I have focused on aviation. And I loved airplanes, I loved to fly, and so forth. But uh, I grew up during the, uh, uh, during the uh, Great Depression, and uh, after after school and on Saturdays, I had a job at the Ford Garage, just being a, being an automobile mechanic, and uh, so and I was earning six dollars a week. Six dollars a week in those days was a really pretty good uh, pretty good income for a kid that's 15, 16 years old. And uh, I, I want to impress on, on you that uh, money was scarce. It just was not, not existent. 
And uh, one day the proprietor of the uh, Ford garage came to me and said, uh, if you want to quit school and, uh, and come with us for full time, we'll pay you $12 a week. Uh, $12 a week was like a gold mine, and I'm serious about that. So I went home and uh, talked to my mother about it, and she put her arms on my uh, hands on my arms and said to me, son, I don't want you to take that job because uh, we can get along with what we are doing now, and I want you to get that education because you, once you've got that education of a high school, nobody can take it away from you. So I want you to go ahead and finish your high school, and then after that, whatever you do, want to do, I will support you as long as it's an honorable profession. I said, okay. So I went ahead and finished high school and uh, I went away to a camp to learn uh, airplane mechanics, but I got there and they just closed out the airplane mechanics course. And I got transferred to another one and they had just, just canceled out the airplane mechanics course. So I studied automobile mechanics a little longer until uh, uh, Delta Airlines started a school at what was then called Candler Field. Now it's called the uh, 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 Jackson or something, another uh, airport. And uh, so I went out there and went through that school with Delta Airlines. And uh, after I got out of it, I started looking for a job and I couldn't find one. And so I went back to the proprietor of the school and said, hey, look, I went through your school. I took your exams, I passed them and all that. And uh, now I can't get a job. He said, yeah, and you're not gonna get a job because there's a lot of people out there that have experience that are out of work and they would come first because they have the experience. I said, now that's kind of stupid. How are you going to get experience unless you get a job? And you got to get a job before you can have ex uh, uh, any experience. He said, well, you join the Army Air Corps. I said, hmm, okay. So I went home and I talked to my mother and she said, oh, in those days you had to be at least 21 uh, to join the service unless you had parents' permission. And uh, she said, if that's what you want to do, I promised you that I would support you in anything you wanted to do as long as it was honorable. So she signed the papers and I joined the Army Air Corps. I became a, uh, an airplane mechanic and uh, a couple of years later I saw an opportunity to go through a flight training school and I applied for it and, and was accepted. And, and that's how I got uh, the second part. And, and the two less, two points that I want to make. One is do not neglect that education. It's absolutely imperative that you get as much education as you can. The second point I want to make is that when you see, when you achieve your first objective, then the next thing you want to do is to set a higher objective and to strive for that and never be content with where you are. Always be trying to improve yourself and to uh, achieve your objectives. Now, when World War II came along, uh, my objectives of uh, just being an airplane mechanic uh, changed. It was uh, laced with patriotism as the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, woke up the American people and uh, they became uh, uh, very, very patriotic and it changed us who were then in the service uh, to become pa patriotic. And so that's, that's how my patriotism developed. And I wanted to make those two points though. Excellent. Oh, 
the one thing I remember, remember about Winslow, Arizona, which was only like five, 6,000, 7,000 people, is like Roy pointed out, 9-11, that same atmosphere that, that went through our nation uh, was the same reaction we had in Pearl Harbor. Our entire community was upset. Uh, there were lines of uh, men and women volunteering to go into the military. Uh, my, I can remember when my brothers went, they left for four and a half years, they were gone. And every day, and I, my mother was a devout Catholic, her brothers, uh, uh, four of them were priests, but every morning, every morning, we would walk three miles to church, you know, whether it was snowing or whatever and so forth. And, and uh, I, you know, she used to pray that they would come home. I used to pray to please come home. I'm tired of walking every morning to church. <laughs> but this one time, uh, Joseph and I were in bed, <clears throat> and he was the one who was in Korea. Uh, he was a little older than me, but... Uh, uh, it was snowing, and I'll never forget that uh, regardless of whether it was snowing, that church, cat, St. Joseph Catholic Church, was full every morning. But that morning, uh, we decided, uh, Mom, uh, it's, uh, I think we're going to stay in bed. And uh, you know how mothers are. I tell you, they've got a way of just uh, making you do things without even saying anything. But she, as she walked out the back door, head in, in high heels, she wore high heels her whole life, and walk, she walked by our window. We always had a cracked window, but just that little voice said, gee, I hope I don't slip and somebody, won't, they won't be able to find me. <laughs> you know, so we remained in bed and then Joe looked at me and he says, oh man, we gotta go, because if she ever fell in the snow, we'd never find her. You know, the guilt complex. So we zoomed off. I stayed in my pajamas. Uh, he had Levi's and I had a little coat and my Bugs Bunny slippers, and I'm, we're running to catch up with her. And all I can remember how she smiled. <laughs> but well, the story ended in church. I became very famous in that town that day. Uh, we got into the church at the back pew there, and she took off my coat, but she forgot to check my, my uh, rear flapper on my buttocks. <clears throat> and as we went to communion, you know, the whole church was laughing. <clears throat> and she took us all to communion. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, Father Hootsman said, what the heck's going on here? I know he was sitting up there with a chalice, you know. And, and uh, he said, uh, little Jay, turn around. And there it was, bow <laughs> cheeks hanging out. <laughs> and, uh, but I can remember, uh, uh, Oh, going to church all the time. The, the, the claim to fame that Joe started it, but I, I took all the glory, it was that troop, troop trains used to come through Winslow, Arizona. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, uh, I had a little red wagon with the wooden sides. I think you recall what they looked like. And, and we'd go by Sam Wu's uh, Chinese public market, and he always had vegetables and tomatoes and peaches and apples all out in front. Well, Joe and I would borrow a whole a wagon load, you know. <clears throat> and I use the word borrow, but you know, the word steal wasn't a big word in our town in those days. And uh, of course it was to Sam, you know, he would call my mother say, you know, da -da 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 -da, in that Chinese accent, he would just, he'd say, those two boys of yours, they're real. My mom said, just, just put it on the tab, we'll take care of it. Well, Joe and I went up and down the line there handing fresh fruit to the troops. And I'll never forget, uh, you know, I was getting ribbons and hats and I had leggings and it, I looked like Zorro. The leggings are only supposed to come to here, but I had, mine were up to here, you know. <laughs> and, but we were giving cantaloupes and poor old, and then Sam Wu decided what we were doing and every day he'd help us load that wagon. <laughs> but uh, the only thing I can recall was uh, there were a certain portion of that train that uh, Mr. Uh, Benny Rodriguez would never let me go, either one of us go to those four car cars because they were, they were full of caskets. But, uh, but the patriotism, again, I'll tell you, it, uh, I just, I want it to come back so bad. This country really needs us to turn everything around again. Leroy, same, same question to you. So obviously a, a little bit different era, right? Um, yeah. Um, 
I still, uh, that's, that's one of the main reasons I'm, I, I continue to stay active in the veteran community is to keep that patriotism alive and share stories of our service members and, and uh, a lot of their lives and my fellow recipients. They were all my heroes growing up. They're still my heroes today. It's one of those things where if we let patriotism fall back, it's, it's our, our troops do it. They don't, they don't do it for uh, the money. They don't do it for medals. They, they serve our country because they feel it's, it's serving something greater than themselves. And we all cheer for sports team, athletes, but if we stop our patriotism and supporting the, the troops who need us and uh, supporting our government, then we're, our, our team's gonna lose. And that's, that's the biggest thing that I, I don't wanna see happen to my, my generation or to my, my children's. But it's, 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 uh, it's, it's starting to be quiet. It started off at a high peak. It's, slowing down and as uh, our country seems like it's going in a spiral downward of debt and still conflict that uh, something that we'll never get out of but those of you I, I hope you never have to face something as bad as I did but adversity is a part of life we've all uh, gone through some hard times in our lives it's how you, what you do after you've gone through that hard time to make your life better that uh, is the, is the big turning point. Uh, so, so follow-up question. I, I want to follow up and, and build a little bit on this, this idea of, of patriotism, but also service. So we know that, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the draft, uh, which was around during World War II and also Vietnam, and now we're at an all-volunteer military service. Uh, fewer than 1% of the people who live in this country will serve in the military. Um, but there are still other ways to serve the country. And so I was wondering if you could you know, talk to our student audience, many of whom probably won't join the military at any point, but what are other ways that they can serve their communities, serve their schools, and build a patriotism, a respect for their communities, and, and that sort of thing? Um, maybe, yeah. No, for me? Uh, but the, the, um, at my ceremony, President Obama probably, the, the words that stuck in my mind the most was, he said, our heroes are all, all around us. And what he meant by that is you don't have to be nationally recognized. You don't have to wear a uniform. In fact, a lot of, a lot of people that want to be in the military sometimes don't make it in for different reasons, whether it be health or, or another, another issue. But uh, you, don't, you don't have to uh, wear a uniform at all to be a hero to somebody. Being a hero to somebody is simply listening to their problems, helping them out with a hard time that they have. And, they may not even tell you thank you, but that's that's the uh, that's the kind of patriot that's that's what patriotism and selfless service is is uh, not worried about the reward, but but taking care of uh, one another in your communities, making your community itself a better place to live. Colonel Vargas, same question to you, and I know that you've done a lot of service both in and outside the service. I think that. Uh to all the students that are here, I think Joe hit the head. Number one, finish your school and become good citizens and, uh, and honor uh, the laws of our country. And you'll never have any problems if you obey your, the laws. And, and each of you have the ability to set an example. And don't worry about what anybody's saying about the country right now or even about you because you. There's not too much you can do yet. But learn and listen and develop and mature into great citizens. And that's what this country needs in the future. And uh, right now, you're the ones that are going to take the lead here. And before you know it, uh, and improve in our communities. And it, at every level, regardless of what field or, uh, that you go into, whether it's education or engineering or whatever. But uh, I believe that uh, you're the ones that are going to really save the patriotism. We're going to fight like heck to, to make sure that it stays on the table. And Leroy's right. Uh, it's, it's kind of in a dip right now, but uh, uh, we just have to be, we, we just got to wake up 
And we've got to pick some good leaders to lead this nation. And uh, not even at the highest level, to the lowest level. There's been some weaknesses and misunderstandings, but right now I tell you, there's nothing, there's no country in the world that can even come close to matching the USA. No one. And always remember that because what you're going to do is you're going to take this forward and you're going to be very successful. I know it. And Joe's right. Don't ever leave school. That's the worst thing you could ever do. And don't get disappointed or depressed because you maybe failed someplace. Uh, you know, I had a few burps in my life, some failures. We all have. But the main thing is you pick yourself up and you go forward and you improve and you work at it and you stay loyal to what you believe in and especially to your God. I'd like to, I'd like to say something uh, at this point. Now, uh, patriotism and heroism or valor, if you want to call it that, is not limited to the military. It's out there, right out in this audience, right here. You may not recognize it right now. It may take some years to, to develop, but there is the potential in this audience to, to achieve great things of, of valor and service to your country and to your fellow man right here. All you have to do is to recognize it when the opportunity presents itself and take action. For instance, when there was a, a, a school shooter in, in a university at, in Seattle, Washington, there was a young man who was a, a student that saw the, uh, the shooter and he ran and tackled that guy and held him down and, and wrestled him until his classmates could come and take away his gun. And uh, that's something that's spontaneous. It's going to happen to you, and you, you're not going to recognize it until it happens. You say, oh, I couldn't do that. To hell you can't. You can do it. Just, to, you know, set your mind to it that when the opportunity happens, that you can do it. That's what I want to say. Mr. Maxwell, same, uh, same question to you. What are, what are ways that these students who are in the audience today, that they can think about serving their country uh, either in or outside of the military? Well, there's a number of ways that I think of. Uh, for example, boys, uh, we've had a number of uh, boys in the Bend area become Eagle Scouts because they volunteered their time and uh, took a World War II veteran to Washington, D.C., uh, took care of all of his needs. Uh, if, he had, if he was in a wheelchair or needed oxygen, whatever that was, whatever that person needed, he escorted him around to all the memorials in Washington, D.C., and then brought him home. Uh, this, of course, is conjunction with the Honor Flight Program, which is a nationwide uh, group of people who uh, want to make sure that the World War II veterans get to see their memorial before they pass on. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of different things that, uh, for example, uh, uh, I, I can think my, my youngest daughter is working for a, a place uh, that's called uh, uh, I forgot its first name, Home Again or something like that. It's a program that, that uh, hires people to take care of the older folks who need help. Uh, she's getting paid for it, very little, but she's, she's dedicating her life to that at this moment. And uh, another daughter who is working in a hospital she draws blood. She doesn't get a whole lot of salary for that, but she's got a good job and, and she, she takes care of people's needs and can do 
the job that nobody wants to do without hurting them. And that, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, you can look around and see what, what is needed in your community. Uh, I remember one, one Eagle Scout is, uh, has obtained an Eagle's badge by cleaning out a, a baptismal font that was, it's, it's, it's almost prehistoric. It, it's been around for, since 1800 or something like that and uh, made a, a, a good looking thing out of it. It removed huge boulders. He's his, uh, uh, inspired his troop to get together and, and move things that couldn't be moved. Made the place look good. And of course, all of this was against the, the wishes of the historic society who said, don't touch that, you'll ruin it. But it, it happened. Just many, many, many things people can do to help the community and to help others. Excellent, thank you. Well, I want to throw it open to our student audience. I know we probably have a lot of questions in the audience that you'd like to ask uh, one of our recipients. So a couple of things. One, uh, we have members of our team who have microphones both upstairs and downstairs here. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. They will come to you uh, and we'll go to you in, in just a second. And the second thing that I'd ask, I would love to get as many student questions in as possible. So if you could direct your question towards a, one of our, a specific recipient. Uh, and that way we can have uh, a number of questions. But I also, before we get to our in-house audience, I know we have uh, an audience online that has been watching as we've live cast this. And so I wanted to first turn to one of our online questions. Um, and this one I will ask, okay, this, uh, this one's for Colonel Vargas. So you, you mentioned earlier that you've had many failures. Uh, so when you receive the medal, the country, people who are in this room think of you as a hero. They think of you as somebody who has succeeded despite the most uh, kind of overcoming challenges. This question is, what's the biggest failure that you've had? Flunk in second grade. <laughs> 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 and it really wasn't my fault. Is my, my mother, we learned one of my brothers was coming back into San Diego for uh, emergency leave. And uh, we decided to spend two months and we were only supposed to have been gone uh, uh, maybe a, a maximum of five or six days. And, you know, coming from Arizona, well, mom fell in love with the San Diego atmosphere, had her son there. He had uh, two weeks of uh, rehab at the Naval Hospital, and uh, uh, we decided to stay close. And <clears throat> I guess the teacher that I had just, uh, Felt that I missed too much school, and, and uh, she didn't call me stupid, <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was the law, that was the rule. And, and uh, so I had to repeat second grade, and uh, I really didn't do as well as I did the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but you passed the second time. Excellent. Uh, so I think we have a question. We'll go over here. Okay. And if you could tell us your name, too, and what school you're from. I'm Ashlyn May. I'm from Steel Canyon High School, and I'd like to address Mr. Petrie. Uh, the Medal of Honor is often considered a burden to receive by many of the recipients. And I was wondering, what would you say has been one of the greatest, um, the greatest blessings to receive the Medal of Honor? Uh, great question. Thank you. And um, my, um, one of my sergeant majors, when, I was, when he was leaving our unit, he brought my wife and I in the office, and paperwork was still going up for the Medal of Honor, and he said the same exact thing. He said, I don't know if this is going to go through, but I want to warn you that it's going to be a, a blessing and a curse all in one. And one of, one of the blessings is uh, you get to share it with others. Uh, it is... One of the fellow recipients stated that it was a, it's a heavy metal to wear around one's neck. It gets lighter on me the more people I share it with because I know it represents the men and women who have served, are serving, and especially those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, one of the hardships though is that your time is, um, is wanted all over the place and you have to start prioritizing uh, time for family, 
time for yourself as well as sharing your time on the road. But it's all enjoyable. Thank you. I think we have another question over here. Um, hello, my name is Christopher Gutierrez. Um, I'm from Del Sur, and um, this is for Mr. Maxwell. Um, with all the changes in today's world, what advice would you give families to, to, uh, when, when their son or daughter decides to go into the military? Did you hear that question? So what advice would you give to families if they have a son or daughter who goes into the military? I would say do everything you possibly can to support that person. Uh, I, I don't advise against going into the military. I think that uh, we're probably needing help today more than ever before. And uh, my advice is to, to the, the person who's going in, that you have a, a responsibility to the nation. You're sworn to uphold the Constitution, your support to the country, and to be patriotic above all things, obey those in command over you, and above all, when you get in a tight situation, use your head, do what is right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. What was his name? The, uh, what's your name again, young man? Chris. Now, look, you heard me talk about my brother saying you better go in the Marine Corps, uh, but that meeting closed out with some great advice, and some of the teachers have already heard me talk about the three golden keys that they gave me. And they said, you know, to be a good Marine, or any service, a branch of service, the best advice that they gave me was that always set your standards high, with reachable goals. The second one is always take care of your troops, whether in peacetime or in combat. And the third one is a, was a, that golden rule they gave me, that third golden rule to be a good Marine is never ask a Marine to do something you wouldn't do yourself. Wow, that's a toughie there. That's the advice I would give you. Excellent, do we have another question? Oh, over here. My name is Joanna Hildreth, also from Seal Canyon High School. Um, I was wondering to any of the recipients who are willing to answer, what is um, the biggest change you've noticed in yourself after receiving the medal? Let's start with Colonel Jackson, maybe. The, the biggest change uh, for yourself after receiving the medal. Wear a lot more suits. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot more traveling, too. Yeah, that's right. You do travel a lot. And, uh, uh, one, one thing that happens immediately is you become a role model to kids. Whether you want to be one or you don't want to be one, you're going to be one whether you like it or not. And you've got you to gotta modify your behavior such as to set an example for those children or young, young people uh, so that they'll be better citizens of the United States and and uh, be imbued with patriotism. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the biggest things that I found mm -hmm. is uh, trying to inspire young people <clears throat> to be better citizens and better patriots. Thank you. you have, uh, Joe's right. You, you, it's demanding, very demanding. And, and luckily I had uh, good mentors, uh, Joe Foss, uh, Walt Eaglers, uh, Rick Sorensen, they told me the do's and don'ts. Uh, boy, and, and a lot of the, the, all of the uh, General Lou Wilson was probably the best one, and uh, it really gave me good advice uh, as when he was coming out of the Marine Corps. He says, uh, it's going to be more difficult to, to wear that medal, Jay, than it was to earn it. And boy, was he right. Uh, and Joe's, Joe and Bob and Leroy know it's a very demanding role that, uh, uh, you know, no longer can you, 
Can you really, you have to set that example, whether you, and Joe's right, whether you like it or not, you have to maintain a good image throughout our nation because this award is the highest award that can be bestowed for valor. And it's not just the citizens that recognize what this medal is, it's those, as Roy pointed out, those that have served um, and those that are serving right now. Uh, we can't let them down. We just, uh, you, have to, you have to be the, the best example you can make of yourself. And granted, it's, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Everybody thinks, oh boy, you get a lot of ice cream and be free beer, and <laughs> not true. You get a lot of invitations and a lot of travel, and, and uh, uh, you, you, can, you can wear yourself out to where it'll affect you, but uh, we still do it because we owe it to you. Okay, we have another, another question right over here. Uh, hello, my name is Marina Malou, and I'm from Valencia High School. Uh, my question is close to Mr. Maxwell. We were wondering if there's any other way for us to show patriotism outside of the military to help, to help our troops. So for you, Mr. Maxwell, how, how can they show patriotism and help the troops outside of joining the military? Without joining? Yes. I think support uh, all of the uh, veterans' activities as much as possible and to uh, support uh, or any project, project that, that helps the, the troops. For example, you've got uh, uh, care packages that go out uh, quite often and uh, uh, I think if you, if, if you show support to the veterans that have come home from the war, they, the soldiers can see what America is doing, that they're supporting the veterans, and that's going to make a, a better feeling, and, a, and there'll be better soldiers for that. Excellent. Thank you. So I think we have enough time for a couple more questions. I want to go up to the balcony first, and then we'll come over here. Hi, my name is Layla Franco, and I'm from Loams Middle School. I was just wondering, how did you feel when you were going in to serve? Anybody want to take that one? So how, how did you feel when you first went in to serve? Uh, myself? Yeah, sure. Uh, nervous, scared. Uh, I had a brother that was getting out of the Army right as, about when I was going in, and I called him up and told him the decision I had made, and his first <laughs> response to me was, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told him I chose, uh, <laughs> I had done well in the test and I, I wanted to uh, pursue the, something that excited me. That was jumping out of airplanes and shooting guns and getting to be around guys that shared the same situation. But uh, going to basic training was a little nervous, not knowing what to expect. and. Um, First time really leaving my home state, and so uh, out on my own, away from my parents. And, but I made friends quickly, and I, I learned that I wasn't going to get myself through basic training. It was the people to the right and left of me that were going to support me in times when I was scared or when I was nervous, and uh, it, it was okay because they were right there with me going through it, through it all. Uh, I, I kind of want to elaborate on that uh, when I use the word scared. Um, fear. fear. Fear is a great thing to have. It's what uh, keeps us all alive overseas. We don't, we, don't, um, we don't talk about it a lot, but we all have it. And it's a, we call it situational awareness. We're, we're looking for every threat out there. But it's uh, the fear of the threat that, that uh, makes us aware of our surroundings. And that's, that's taking care of one another. And that, that's what it's all about, is we don't serve alone. When you join the service and you put on a uniform, you're part of a team. And that, that's one of America's greatest teams. Excellent. Thank you. I think we had another question oh. right over here. Hello. My name is Victoria Jerusalem, and I'm from Martin Luther King High School. My question is for Colonel Jackson. What was the most pivotal moment in your military career? What was the... So, Colonel Jackson, so uh, what was the most pivotal moment in your military career? 
Oh, good heavens. <laughs> uh, Don't you say I got married, because Rose will kick you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, have, I have a trivia question that says, what's the longest sentence in, in the English language? And it's, the answer is, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I, 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 could, I could tell you the, the most rewarding period of my life uh, in the military, and that was uh, when I was in the U-2 program in 1956, uh, 7, 8, 9, and 60. Uh, we did a lot. We did a lot of things uh, for this nation in, in flying the U-2 that uh, you will never hear about. And I will never tell you, but it, uh, it uh, provided a heck of a lot of intelligence for our leaders to be able to take that information and develop a national policy from the information that they got from, uh, from our collection of intelligence data. And this is not only for the Air Force uh, side of the house, but also for the CIA. I, uh, side of the house of uh, uh, collecting information and doing uh, reconnaissance. Uh, that, that, that was the, one of the most rewarding things that I had ever done. Excellent, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm gonna go right over here, this young lady's been Cheyenne there. Lynch from Wilson Middle School, and my question's for Mr. Maxwell. What did you learn in, your, in the service that you took into your life after the service? So the question was for you. So what, what did you learn during your time in the service that you've really taken with you and, and used in your uh, post-service years? I think uh, the development of, further development of uh, mechanical uh, ability. I took a, a course in, while I was in the military, uh, United Armed Forces Institute in auto mechanics, and of course, I didn't think much about it at the time, but I think that really triggered my, uh, setting me up for my career for the next 30 years. Excellent, thank you. All right, I wanted to give just a, just a few minutes before we wrap up, I wanted to give each of our panelists a chance to share a final thought or a final message that, that really ties together um, the message and what we've been talking about today and, and the uh, impetus behind the character development program. And I was hoping we could start with you, Leroy. So you, your son is in the audience today. Um, and, and one of the things that I think about education is that anything you would want for your own child is also something you would want for every, every child in the country. Absolutely. Uh, education is, is one of the biggest things out there that I, I, I could probably get through my, the rest of my life without a college degree because I left I left off to the Army before I was able to finish that, and I'm going back to school now, and my son knows about it. When I, when I first made the dean's list, uh, the first thing I did was I called the whole family down to the kitchen, put dad's dean's list, which is like the honor roll, I got a letter in the mail, put it right up on the refrigerator, and I said, that's what you should strive for, and it's to always do your best. It, it wasn't easy. I'm not great at at studying, but uh, some of us aren't great at athletics. Some of us have to work harder than the others. And it's to find out what you're great at and work harder at the things that you're not, to self-improve every day. Every day that, as you go to bed tonight and you uh, think of all the stuff that you have and all the stuff that you want out of your life, when you wake up in the morning, you're, you're, uh, you're blessed to have lung, air in your lungs and to be able to open your eyes. You have what, what is the greatest thing in the world. You have an opportunity. And what you, you have an opportunity to do is to make your own choices. Every day when you get up, you, you make choices that will lead you down a great path or not so good. And don't, uh, don't fall astray, but uh, keep focused on the good things in your life and the good people around you. Surround yourself with greatness and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll end up there. Um, the, these gentlemen, like I said, were inspiration for me. Find that inspiration in your life. Be that inspiration to somebody else. I, I go home, I don't want to watch um, 
real housewives of anywhere. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to watch Kardashians. I, I want to watch my uh, neighbors. I want to help them out. I want to go out and spend time with my children. I want to be a good per pillar in my community. I want to be a leader in my community. I want to help others around me succeed and in turn work on succeeding myself. Thank you. So, Jay, the question I have for you, so your, your bachelor's degree, as I understand it, is in education, correct? Uh, and you've served your country in a number of ways. Now, as an educator, what message do you have for our audience today? Well, to the students, I want to say, and Joe hit the bullet, don't ever quit school. If a little punky guy like me can, I've finished all my advanced degrees, and I'm very proud of doing that. I'm the first in the family to have really gone forward with the, with the, not just the bachelors, but all the way up. Um, the one thing I want to leave with you in your lives today is, and I want Matt to know this, always believe in yourself, always be yourself, believe in your God or the Spirit or the High Supreme Being that you believe in, always love your parents above all things, and never quit. If you fall, you fail, pick yourself up. The world isn't going to end. And just push forward. But when I say always be yourself, I'm talking about the way I want to see young people start dressing as sharp as many of you are dressed today. I'm tired of seeing Sears shorts hanging out of Levi's. <laughs> I want people to, to go back to the basics of being themselves and not trying to be some actor or a movie star or Kardashian or whatever. I can't even say that family's <laughs> name. <laughs> you know, but, uh, and believe in yourself. Never stop believing in yourself. And I guarantee you, your future will be the best that you've ever, ever experienced. And someday you're going to look back. You remember that old goat sat in that room and he always told me to believe in myself? Believe in yourself, because you can do anything. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with uh, Jay and Leroy 100%. And uh, one thing, one little bit of advice that I have is never, never, never stop trying because if you do, that's when you lose. Always pick yourself up and try to do better because you, you can do it. You can do it and keep it through your head and don't ever forget it. I can do that. And I'm sure that once you get that attitude, you can do it. Thank you. I think we need to have more, more love and patriotism for our country. In spite of uh, all of the defects and the, the faulty leadership that we have, our country is still a free country. It's still America. We can still uh, say what we want to say as long as it doesn't step on somebody else's toes. And remember this thing, the Constitution guarantees freedom of speech, but it also says that we must be responsible for what we say. That if we, if we say something that hurts someone else, we're responsible, and that is not free speech. The other thing is uh, we, we seem to be lacking a bit of in patriotism for the country. Uh, observe people's reaction in a parade when the flag goes by. How many will uh, give proper attention to the flag? And, and that's uh, something that is an indication that we might be slipping a little bit. Thank you.
Do we, have, do we have time for one quick question? One quick it, question. It's been killing me here, but I heard Joe say that he wanted to uh, be a mechanic and fly since he was five. And I was just curious, what, what inspired you to want to do that? What inspired me to want to be a mechanic? Well, I can tell you a little short story. Uh, it occurred when I was about five years old. My father and one of my brothers and I were walking down the road. I, I think we had been fishing, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember it very well that far back because that's about a <laughs> hundred years or so ago. <laughs> and uh, I heard this noise and I looked up and I saw this airplane up there and it was zooming through a cloud and would do a, a loop, a loop de loop and go back through the cloud and zoom around. And I stood and I watched that airplane and I come, became absolutely fascinated with it. And it was at that moment that I decided I wanted to be in aviation, and my first step was to become an airplane mechanic, and the second step was to get as much flying in as I possibly could, hoping that if I, if I got to be a mechanic, I could beat some of the pilots out of a little bit of instruction and learn to fly myself, because that's really what I wanted to do. And that's how I got started in aviation, Leroy. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> we strongly believe in is that each of you, in your way, uh, I should say all of you, always at the end of the day, thank you teachers. They have given you so much. You know, it, uh, I remember I was told, you know, don't be afraid to go up and say, Mr. So-and-so, that was a tremendous presentation you, did, you made today. And don't be afraid to go up and say, Mrs. So-and-so, that was a horrible presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but we love you. But always thank them at the end of the day. They are, without the teachers, we would go nowhere. Excellent. So I have two very quick logistical notes before a final thank you. One. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please remain seated while the recipients, uh, they're going to go up to the museum store and be signing books. So if you'd like to get a signed copy uh, of the Medal of Honor book, it's on sale upstairs afterwards in the, in the museum store. Uh, and we'd love for you all to stop by. Uh, and two, uh, members of our team are going to come and dismiss the students. Uh, so please stay seated until you are uh, dismissed. Other than that, please join me in thanking our four Medal of Honor recipients for their service to our country. You might, you know, I'm sure.